Father's Love Begotten, which is a beautiful, beloved Christmas carol by the Belgian composer Floor Paters. One of the, I mean, all organists are workhorses, but he was a workhorse among workhorses, a composer, teacher, director of sacred music, incredibly uh, prolific and active for a long time, knighted by the Pope for his musical work. How do you like that? I haven't reached that level yet. But anyway, here are two short pieces by Floor Paters, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and Of the Father's Love Begotten. <clears throat>
next one isn't so short. It's one of the great 18 or Leipzig chorales associated with J.S. Bach's last and most mature period as the cantor, music director of St. Thomas Church, he was Der Thomas Cantor in Leipzig. And he spent several decades there, wrote his great cantatas, not much of his organ music, but 18 great Lutheran chorales were given extraordinary long and spacious treatments. He was forgotten after his death, but in 1844, Felix Mendelssohn gave an Allbach concert in Leipzig, and he played another one of these great 18, um, Deck Thyself My Soul with Gladness. And the music critic in the audience just rhapsodized that it was like an ocean or a river of melody. That little, little known music critic was Robert Schumann. <laughs> but this is the savior of the nations come. Uh, it's a very straightforward chorale. Savior of the nations come, based on the Latin, uh, veni redemptor gentium, something like that. But what Bach does to it is amazing. So here it is.
Another short, cryptic, and very creative piece is by Calvin Hampton, who only lived among us just under 46 years. I uh, did my graduate research on him at Indiana University, but I had also known him as a child. I grew up in the city. He was the organist at the Episcopal Church across the park, uh, Calvary on Gramercy Park, and was the most wonderful Halloween monster ever. And that, of course, hooked me. <laughs> but he also gave remarkable Sunday afternoon organ recitals, and soon after we moved out of the city, they moved to Fridays at midnight to have been able to stay through my teenage years, you know. But um, he died as a result of AIDS in uh, 1984. Um, you know, 1938, uh, he could still be alive, you know, and composing. He was a fascinating character. And this is his very interesting setting of Silent Night. Uh, you almost aren't sure what, what key it's in, but it's never jarring. So here it is. Did you follow the tune? <laughs> Where was it going? It all made sense at the end. <clears throat> I've never done this before. Before I went into music, I was intending to get a PhD in English literature at uh, the University of Chicago. And uh, one of my fields was American poetry. I've always been a great admirer of Robert Frost. My uncle often told me the story of how he you know, met him, got to sit next to him for a while and asked him questions, and you, you know how the story turned out. I wrote that years ago, and I don't remember what it meant. Yeah, okay. They say that all the time. But some years ago, I published a short article where I compared uh, that famous poem by Lydia Marie Child, uh, the New England Boys' song about Thanksgiving Day, better known as Over the River and Through the Woods, um, and Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Lydia Child was young when she wrote that poem, and she grew up in Medford, Massachusetts, 
which is right on top of one of the several rivers in New England called Mystic River. She was right on the Mystic and then the trackless wilderness of Massachusetts beyond it. And when she writes over the river and through the woods to grandfather's house, sorry, it's grandfather in the original, um, not to stir the pot, but uh, it seemed to me to be a perfect image also of the Puritan or Christian view of life over the river of baptism, the Jordan River, through a dark forest to grandfather's house. And it's a beautiful story, not just of a kid being happy on Thanksgiving, but what our whole life journey is. And Robert Frost, a hundred and something years later, not quite a hundred years later actually, has us stuck in the woods, between the woods and a frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. The horse isn't so sure now, asks if there is some mistake, and a little snow is falling, but he has to keep going. And what a wonderful, different view of that, I think, that same New England journey. It isn't always going to the pumpkin pie, is it? Right? But in his last book, In the Clearing, published shortly before he died, Robert Frost um, died in 1963. If you are old enough, you remember he read at Kennedy's inauguration. He was, tried to read, the sun was too bright, so he recited a poem from memory, but In the Clearing has the original poem. Uh, it also has a poem about Kitty Hawk, <clears throat> where flight first happened. And in, it's the only really religious thing Frost wrote in his whole life, as far as I know. And it sums up the Christmas spirit in a funny, but I think a wonderful way, thinking of the incarnation and describing man's effort to enter the ether in an airplane. Frost writes this, but God's own descent into flesh was meant as a demonstration that the supreme merit lay in risking spirit in substantiation. Spirit enters flesh and for all its worth charges into earth in birth after birth ever fresh and fresh. We may take the view that its daring do, thought of in the large, is one mighty charge on our human part of the soul's ethereal into the material. And as I think of how the air goes through the organ pipes and the ethereal enters the material, we have a little bit of Christmas every day, don't we? Anyway, those are some thoughts for Christmas and um, I've never gotten a chance to read a poem before in a recital, but I had fun, I hope you did. Um, the next piece on the program is not on the program, it's a musical surprise. It's a piece by Gerald Finzi, English composer, uh, died quite young, you know, in his early 50s, but before he died there was an all Finzi program at the Royal Festival Hall. He was that well respected. And this is one of his five bagatelles for piano and clarinet. It's called Carol, and it seems appropriate for Christmas. I'd like to introduce when he's ready with his uh, clarinet. Short, lovely piece, you'll like it. Bill Powers.
Uh, this last piece is to put you in mind of singing Christmas carols, so warm up your vocal cords. It's a wonderfully corny piece, I hope there's butter available, called the, jo <laughs> butter and salt maybe? Uh, it's called The Joy of Christmas by Lanny Smith, and I found it in a publication 39 years ago, and I've been playing it ever since because I think it's just a lot of fun. So, The Joy of Christmas, and then you're going to take part in what comes next.
many verses shall we sing, John? Uh, why don't we do the first two? First two verses. <laughs> Two angels we have heard on high.
1162, the first Noel. Give us a few verses to go by, John. Okay, let's do uh, one, two, and four. Seventy-one. Hark the herald angels sing. And we'll do one and three.
60? <laughs> oh, sure. <Okay>. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that what someone said? Oh, we just did that. Um, One seventy-three. Oh, come all you faithful. Verses one and four.
to be bashful. 163. Two. 162. Okay. First Noel. We did that already. Didn't we do that? Yeah. Did we do that one? No. Oh, yes, we did. Yes, we did. One six five. I wonder as I wander. Mm. done, then we can finish with Silent Night, number 164. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next Sunday.